Good morning. Welcome to uh, Appomattox Courthouse National Historical Park. I'd like to thank a few folks who helped make this possible before we start getting into it. I'd like to thank uh, the Idaho Education Network, uh, Internet2, Magpie, and of course the agency I know and love, the National Park Service. So um, we're here commemorating really the close of the American Civil War. I'm standing here on a very drizzly day. I'm not sure what the weather's like in Kansas right now. Can you all tell me what the weather's like? What's, what's going on here up in Kansas where you're at? I guess uh, a little bit different than what we have here, but it's a very drizzly day. Behind me is the McLean House. So 150 years ago today, um, on that spot is where Robert E. Lee surrendered to Ulysses Simpson Grant. There would be a few more battles of the Civil War, but really it was all but over with the surrender here at Appomattox Courthouse, the end of the American Civil War. The town of Appomattox says this is the place where America reunited. Uh, since we're talking about the American Civil War, can anyone tell me about a little bit about the Civil War? Have you read anything about it? Have you uh, studied it in class a little bit? Anyone mention anything about the American Civil War? Well, the uh, Civil War was uh, our most costly war in terms of lives. Over 700,000 Americans were killed in the American Civil War, okay, who's got, who's both got a North and you? South. It was indeed a civil okay, war, so it's like two groups of Americans. Uh, one of the reasons that the casualties were so high is that it was regarded really as the first modern war. And when we say modern war, what are we talking about? What are some of the things that we may think about for modern war? Well, I'll tell you what, I'll give you a little hint. Uh, we talk about modern Can you hear us? I can, I can hear you, Linda, but I can't hear the students. Are they hearing me? Okay. Yes, you have to wait till they get up here to the microphone so you can... You're, you're oh, okay, they have to fast. go to the microphone. All right, so let's talk about, we're going to talk about the first, modern, the Civil War is the first modern okay, war. Okay, you want to answer the question? Come up to the mic. <laughs> Go ahead. All right, modern war is taking away resources from the enemy side, like their crops, the uh, food supplies, uh, crop, food supplies, uh, land, more than likely, like that stuff. Nick? Kind of, kind of. We talk about modern war, we're talking also technology, all right? So let's, um, you know, talk about technology. I got a piece of technology here, my little Park Service iPhone. Uh, what might be the equivalent that the, they would have had in the Civil War? Can we throw something up on the screen there? That's uh, Loudoun Park, a national cemetery, talking about 700,000 Americans dying in the American Civil War. Uh, that was the beginning of our modern national cemeteries. Uh, a lot of these are on the East Coast. One of them is Arlington, you know, where the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier is. This one here is outside of Baltimore City. And it was the technology that actually resulted in some of these huge casualties. Okay, there we go, back to my iPhone. We got some poles. Looks like there's some wires on those poles. Does anyone want to take a, a crack at what that's about? You know, what those wires and poles are doing. It has to do with communication technology. The telegraph. Telegraph, that's right. Like, okay. it didn't have the telephone, but telegraph, you tapped the messages out. So, mass communications, that's where I was going with the iPhone. That, you know, these armies can communicate with one another. The dispatches can be relayed to Washington. Uh, so, mass communications, quick communications, um, by the standards of the day through the telegraph. Yeah. See so if we can get another picture up there. All right, what do we got going on there? That's an easy one. Hot air balloon, right? Hot air so, balloon. right, that's right. So, talking to hot air, not, not just me here at Mattis Courthouse talking to hot air, talking to hot air balloon, but aerial observation. 
That, so the idea of getting up really high, observing, and then using communication. So today, you know, we talk about drones flying around, you know, getting observation. Well, in the Civil War, they didn't have drones, but they most certainly had observation balloons. Let's see if we can get another picture up there. Ah, this is a really important one. Railroads. Um, and uh, there's an old saying that says the amateur studies tactics, but the generals study logistics. And so really you see uh, there's a mortar, um, kind of like a sawed off cannon in a way. But more important than that, if you look behind it, is that box car. And when we say logistics, we mean things that soldiers are going to need in the field. Can anyone tell me perhaps what the most important singular thing every soldier needs? I guarantee you need it every day of the week, perhaps three times a day. Food, that's right, we're dialed in on that one, food. Right, so think about it. You know, if you're talking, say, the Union Army here at Appomattox, 70,000 guys. If every guy has, say, a pound of meat a day, that's 70,000 pounds of meat the, you're going through every day of the week. Same thing for the Confederates. So you have to, how do you supply these guys? And that's just the food, man. We're not even talking about the shoes and the socks and, and all that other stuff, but the food. And that supply is actually going to, is the main reason why the armies wind up here. Why It shapes how this happens. We're going to talk uh, very briefly about what brought the armies here. And then... We're going to uh, meet some soldiers. Real quick, a little bit of food. This is a piece of hard tack. Uh, basically, it's like a cracker and didn't break yet. Um, but this is uh, one of the standard rations for the time. We also have a cup of coffee. That was a kind of a luxury, but you could dip your hard tack in your coffee, soften it up, and then eat it. So let's look at some maps. Let's work a little geography in here. Talk about the Appomattox campaign. Okay, first of all, um, one, what's that, uh, the, the coolest state in the Union? It's in the middle of the map there. What state are we talking about? Let's hear a big shout for the great state of? There you go. And what, si what, what state is, you know, we, the uh, southern states of the Southern Confederacy are in gray. Northern states are in blue. What state is Kansas? What side is it on? Blue. Right, blue meaning the Union, the North. But remember, before the Civil War, there were some who were pro-Southern living in Kansas. So uh, nearby, Missouri, Kentucky, border states, all right? Can anyone name a battle of the Civil War for me? In the course of the was that? Antietam. One. Go. Antietam. Antietam. Very Antietam. good. When I come, that's actually Antietam is in the state I come from, the great state of Maryland. All right. Gettysburg is in Pennsylvania. And so just to, to look at, you have what they call the Western Theater and then the Eastern Theater. Uh, Eastern theaters like Virginia and Maryland, Southern Pennsylvania. So we're talking the Eastern Theater with this campaign. Let's... Um, Look, uh, all right, good, with this campaign. East, so you see Virginia, Maryland, Eastern Theater. Western Theater would have been Tennessee, uh, then it goes down to Georgia, and then eventually the Union armies move east as the, as the Union starts winning the war. All right, let's get quickly to the, uh, to the Appomattox campaign, and then we want to meet some of the figures that play into our story here. Let's, let's get another map up real quick. All right. So 1865, you know, January, February, March, you know, some of the final months of the American Civil War. You see two cities, Richmond and Petersburg. And uh, in red, those are the entrenchments, like a big ditch uh, where the, the southern soldiers are dug in, defending Richmond, defending Petersburg. Uh, Union, sold, uh, Union lines are in blue. And what do you see on the left coming off of those cities? Uh, it's south of Petersburg, and then also there's one that is on the other side of Richmond. It's a line with like little marks on that. It has the RR next to it. What do you think that stands for? Railroad. Railroad. Very good. Hey, 
hey, well, I'm not saying the question is going to be super hard, all right? So, in a sense, they're, the Confederates don't want those to lose those cities, but to keep the cities, they need to keep those railroads open because that's bringing the food in. And in April 1st, Union uh, forces kind of get around the line and they start getting close to that South Side Railroad, which is near Petersburg. And once they, uh, the Confederates know that railroad line is going to be lost, then they have to withdraw and they're going to move west, trying to stay in line with that railroad so they can keep their troops and their army fed. Let's got another slide there. Okay. Um, this map basically is in red the Confederates retreating, moving further and further west. And the Union is, uh, federal soldiers who outnumber the Confederates are tracking with them and they're trying to get between the Confederates and that railroad. And for most of the campaign they managed to do that. And these guys are marching an awful lot. Uh, both are not eating regular meals on a daily basis. They're, they're, they're going fast beyond their supply lines. In some cases, the Confederate Army not able to access those railroads, are not able to get their food, and so they're supplying things on wagons. But you got to feed the horses on the wagons too. So if the horses are running short of food, so these, these are you know these guys are marching through the night, through the day, and then at the very end of the map is where we're standing right now, 150 years to the day at Appomattox Courthouse. Uh, Union soldiers have seized a key railroad junction, and there's Union soldiers on both sides of the Confederate Army. Now, as these troops are moving, in a sense, they're moving through Virginia. But for one soldier, ironically, he'd been in the Army for years, and that route is taking him home. This uh, McLean house is right on a lane called Tibbs Lane. And there was a soldier in Lee's Army who was a lieutenant. His uh, name was Thomas Tibbs. And uh, I, I'd like to present Thomas Tibbs to you, and he will tell you his story. We're going to get multiple points of view today, different perspectives. Good morning. I, I can't tell you much of the situation. We, we come through town in the middle of the night. This morning I, I found myself in my own front yard, 200 yards from the house I grew up in and left four years ago. I haven't been home in, in all that time. And I don't know if my family's safe or if they've left town or not. We, uh, we attacked this morning just west of the village trying to drive that Yankee cavalry off a ridge line just out here and open our escape. But they brought up their infantry and sure enough pushed us back. And, now the word is the army's falling back, all of us, back through town across the river. Don't know what's going to happen next. It's a far cry from what it was four years ago when I joined this here army right here in my own hometown. I joined up with the cavalry, the 2nd Virginia Cavalry to be exact. All, all my friends and neighbors, we all signed up together, thinking the war would be over in just a few months, thinking it would be a, a great deal of fun. Joined up with my best friend, Lafayette Meeks, I must say he he died of, of disease of typhoid just six months into the war. He certainly wasn't the last. I was in more fights than I can even tell you now for the last four years. I was wounded on two occasions. Found myself promoted from private to the rank of first lieutenant. And all this last week, we've been marching and fighting nearly every day. Soldiers drifting off from the from the army, deserting, heading for home. Others just can't keep up. I couldn't even say how many men we've lost. I know my brother. My brother disappeared from our ranks at Sailor's Creek a few days back. I don't know if he's alive or a prisoner. But I hope, I pray to God, he's still alive. But now I don't know what else more I could tell you. I don't know what the future's going to hold for us. When I grew up. My family was one of the most prosperous in this in this part. It's 300 acres of land, 11 slaves, prosperous tobacco farm, and our whole future is uncertain now. I just can't believe it come to this. Oh, these, these students may want to ask you. Oh, a yes, question sir. Or two. If I have a chance, I'll be happy to answer. Any questions out there for Lieutenant Tibbs? Hang on one second, we got someone coming. Stand right. over on the side so they can see you. There you go. Oh, Captain Preston, can spare you, uh, me for a moment. Can you, ever, you ever get the, can you ever get to see your family again? Or, like, uh, well, sir, I haven't seen my family since I've been here. No, uh, 
I've, uh, I don't know if they were down in the basement, hunkered down. There was fighting going on just a few hundred yards from, from them. I know the, uh, the Yankees appear to be entering the house now, perhaps going up on the roof. You, you can see quite a ways from up there, but I don't know if they're home or not, my family. So I, I hope they're safe. I, I'm the eldest of nine children. My brother John and I are the only ones in the Army. Everyone else is home, as far as I know. I just pray they're safe. Thank you. Yes, sir. Does anybody else want to ask a question? We got one. We got another one. Come around the front here. Go ahead. Loud. Are you prepared if there is a surrender? And what would you do? If there is a surrender, well, if General Lee surrenders this army, as it appears he might be forced to, we're all but surrounded here. I reckon I'd abide by the orders of General Lee and go home if that's what it is. The word is that if we are surrendered, Grant ain't going to send us up to prison camps. The word is he might just send us on home. And I, if that's the case, then, then I might just get to see my family very soon. But it would be rather hard, I have to say, to go through the last four years seeing what I've seen and doing the things I've done and all of it be in vain, all the losses of friends and neighbors. But if it, if it is God's will that that should occur, then I suppose I have no choice but to accept it. Go ahead. One um, more. If he does surrender, will you find it ironic that it is starting and ending in the McLean house front yard? Sure. Well, in terms of Mr. McLean, I, I understand, as you say, he was up there at uh, Northern Virginia, Manassas, where that, that first big fight was. I, I was there myself in the cavalry back then. And I understand he come down here just about two years ago. He tells folks to get away from the war, as you may be saying, fleeing from the fighting and all. But see, the other thing he don't tell anyone is he come down here to make money as well. Using that railroad just up the road here to sell things like sugar that are in scarce supply down in the south. And I understand Mr. McLean's made a lot of money off this war, so I don't feel a whole lot sorry for him. I'll be honest with you there, but I expect he does see it rather ironic. Thank you, Lieutenant. You're very welcome, sir. I appreciate that. You can get back on out here. We, we uh, saw one of the Confederate soldiers in Robert E. Lee's army, but and we mentioned that they were outnumbered. But I have here uh, Corporal Fields, uh, who's actually one of the Union soldiers. If you could tell us, you know, maybe where you came from, why you joined up, and what this campaign has been like. I have a lot of marching, I understand. That is a fact. Um, well, I enlisted back in 61 in western Pennsylvania, and from there we went to Fort Washington outside of the capital. Then we joined General McClellan, his Peninsular Campaign, and I saw the elephant for the first time on May the 5th of 62. Then from there, we were sent down to North Carolina, from North Carolina to South Carolina. We were there for over a year, and then from there, we were sent up in 64 to uh, Bermuda 100, just outside of Richmond, sort of north of Petersburg and south of Richmond. We participated in the campaign before Richmond there, and then, well, Last week, they moved us from uh, from Bermuda 100, north of the Appomattox and James Rivers, down along a place called Hatcher's Run. Uh, you folks are familiar about what happened on April the 1st, a place called Five Forks. Well, we didn't participate in that, but... They might not. I mean, you know, uh, some of the, the townsfolk here are from Kansas. So, they, they, they're west. So, Five Forks, that's near Petersburg, isn't well, it? Well, it is. It's further to the west. It's Lee's last supply line into Petersburg. And, well, our Cav boys in the Fifth Corps, well, we politely took it from them. And they weren't able to use it anymore. So, then we, uh, well, the next day we broke through the Sixth Corps first, followed by us. And, well, we attacked a place called Fort Gregg later on in the day. Fort Gregg being one of the last strongholds of the Confederate defenses just before we get to Petersburg. Well, that night we stopped, and the next morning we went into Petersburg and found they were gone. So they started marching us about 10 o'clock in the morning, and, well, we marched down to Burkeville, and from Burkeville up to Rice's Station, where we ran into some southern boys. That's just near Farmville. Uh, How perhaps, far is that from where we're at right now? Oh, it's close to 40 miles or so, um, near Sailor's Creek, where Lee lost a good chunk of his army on April the 6th. But we were there at Rice's Station on April the 6th, so we didn't participate in, in Sailor's Creek. And then uh, 
Well, on April the 8th, they marched us, start about a little before 5 in the morning, they marched us till midnight, and they tell us we covered some 35 miles that one night alone. Walking with all that stuff? Well, walking just as I am, one of the best marches we ever went on, only because we didn't have any stragglers, and, well, we, we just kept in line, and we had a sense, you could say, that, well, we were almost near and almost beaten Lee's army. So after four years, you could almost feel that the war was coming to a close. Will you say most of the men in your unit could feel that? We had Lee on the run. The first time we really had him on the run and all his veterans and such. Well, they put us, let us go to sleep about midnight on April the 8th. And then, well, of course, officers, as you know, are mighty gracious. They got us up at 3 o'clock in the morning on April, well, this morning on April the 9th. And they marched us another few miles before they stopped us and told us we could have breakfast this morning. You folks ever been really hungry and just waiting for food first thing in the morning? Uh, yeah. uh, well, if, if that's the case, have you ever had to not have breakfast right after you fixed breakfast? Well, that's what happened to us. See, the cannon started firing from this place, and we formed into battle, well, formed into our columns, and came out this way, formed into battle line through this thick fog, and then we stepped out of this tree line, and there was the rebel army straight in front of us almost as if uh, we were on their flank and so we hit them hard and drove them all the way back down and across the town here and well then those white flags came out this morning just a little while ago and well since then uh, just kind of like this one here uh, something like that i suppose and well then we uh well we've been holding our position fairly steady just a few hundred yards that way and i came down here to look to see if i could see any rebel boys and not much going on here in town, but... Well, since you're here, I mean, they may have some questions about you. So let's let's open it up. You know, if you want to ask him, we were asking the Confederate soldiers some questions. Let's see if we get a different perspective. And, you know, why is this you? What's up with this Union guy? What, you know, why did he join up? What's he seeing? So feel free to ask a question, too. You, you mentioned you saw the elephant for the first time. Can you explain what that means, saw the elephant? Well, that's just a soldier term for being in my first battle. That's all it means. Fancy talk, I suppose, for folks not in the Army, but, uh, well, for us, it's just a way of saying, hey, I've been in battle, I've seen the elephant. Uh, most like some folks have uh, been up to you know, see an amusement for the first time. I got a question. You ever, you ever run into any Native while you're going through there? Pardon? Native American? You ever run into any Native Americans? Like I can't say I ever yeah. did. Uh, uh, are you, you referring to, well, Indian, Indian folk? No, they used to be Indian. in our area. I mean, back in the well old time when I grew up. But I was reading about, stories. isn't there uh, a Native American on Grant's staff? Uh, Parker? Have you, have you heard about that? Talk in the ranks? An Eli Parker? Well, now that you mention it, I have heard something about it don't know much about General Grant. You see, I've never really met the gentleman. I still ride by on the occasion, but uh, not uh, not anything I can be definite of. But General, I think one of General Grant's uh, staff officers is a Native American. And they say that if Grant comes here to this house to accept the surrender of Robert E. Lee, that man will be here. And actually, that Native American, Eli Parker, would draft those terms of surrender uh, you know, on, on an official document, one of the best uh, men to, to write, you know, very, very um, clear handwriting in Lee's army and a, an officer under, uh, under Grant's command. Well, that would be something and something I've never heard of before, but that is the case. Yeah, Eli Parker. Yeah. Got another question? Uh, have you ever worked with any colored troops? On a few occasions, we have out there at Petersburg. We fought some, uh, fought with some out that way, and then of course this morning there were some boys that were a part of the 25th Corps attached to our 24th Corps, and uh, well they were down the line for me, so I didn't see too much of them. But well, we've we've run into them and worked with them on the occasion, and put up the scrap when necessary, like most other boys do. What? One more question: If there is a surrender, what? do you think should happen to the Confederate troops? I don't know if I can rightly say that's, that's for a man of higher uh, rank than me, but 
Well, I suppose if I want to go home, then I suppose they should. They put up a fair enough scrap, I suppose. Maybe take some of their officers and teach them a lesson and whatnot, or some of the troublemakers, the hotheads, if you wouldn't say. But, uh, well, for the rest, I guess those folks just realizing now that they've been lied to about, well, caught maybe reason why they started the ruckus in the first place. Thank you, Corporal. Oh, my pleasure, sir. <laughs> so we heard from two soldiers, but Appomattox was a village, you know, and uh, so I want you to meet some of the townsfolk, or actually one, one of the more esteemed residents of the village, uh, a Dr. Christian. Now, this portrayal, just like in the last portrayal that you saw, he's going to be talking like it's that time. When you ask questions, though, he'll address it in, in character. Very good. Dr. Christian, could you come over here? I understand you were hearing some of the gunfire. Uh, tell some of these townsfolk uh, where you were a little bit. Introduce yourself. And, and... Sure. Sure. Thank you, sir. Uh, well, good morning to you. My name is William Christian. I'm a local physician. Uh, those adults of y'all, y'all can call me Will or Bill, and you children, I'll suffer you to call me Dr. Christian. Thank you. Um, uh, I did hear the gunfire this morning. My daughter and I were, were up here on the Oakville Road uh, on the backside of the village. <laughs> Um, I, I reckon I should tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, my, my parents uh, came here right after the, the war with England, the Revolutionary War, and uh, uh, I was born in a place called Dugadsville, not too far from here on the James River. Uh, they began farming a plot of land about four or five miles from here, east of the village, um, and that is now our land. Uh, my wife and I live there, and we've raised six children. Um, my two oldest boys went off to fight for Robert E. Lee's army. Um, I'm still not sure how I felt about that or feel about it today. Uh, in the years before the war, uh, back before the, the dominant parties in this country were Republican and Democrat, there was a Whig party, and I was the head of the Whig party here in, um, in Appomattox County. Um, I reckon we, we didn't want any kind of war, uh, either foreign or, or, or between ourselves, but once it was thrust upon us, well, my oldest boy, you, you couldn't even tie him up and keep him in the barn. He was ready to go off to fight, and, and then his, uh, his next youngest brother, why, when, when he turned 18 and, in 18 and 63, he went to fight as well. The reason I'm here in the village today is now that Lee's army has gathered here and apparently suffered a defeat, I, I was hoping to find my two sons and, and perhaps shepherd them home to their mother. Um, but there's there's a multitude of men here in Lee's army, and I'm just not just not sure where to look for them. Um, a lot of people are asking me what what I think the future holds. And, and I think it's it's probably too early to say that. Um, it appears the Federals want to deny me of my property. After that, I don't know which way the world will turn. Um, I think that's all I have to say to you this morning, unless I can uh, satisfy whatever curiosities you might have for me. Is anybody interested in asking me any? Any questions? Yeah, we have we have two questions, Dr. Christian. Dr. Christian, have the Confederate forces asked you to treat for wounded men or sick? Uh, our farm is about, as I said, about four miles from here, and it's near where Lee's rear guard is in a place called New Hope Church. And we haven't seen any wounded men there, but there are plenty of sick and exhausted men that that we have allowed to, to stay in our barn there on, on our property. Um, I, I look towards them, but I, I haven't really had to treat them medically except for to provide them some food and some water and a comfortable place to sleep. Thank you. Any other curiosities that I can settle for you? Uh, Dr. Christensen, what will be the first thing you do uh, when or if you see your sons? Well, do you have children? Do you no. Have children? Uh, I'm not no. old enough. 
Oh, I see. I'm sorry. Well, a parent's love for their child is overwhelming, and, and I don't know that I can put it into words, but but when I do see them safe, and, and God willing, I do, it'll be a happy moment. I have a question, Doctor. Yes, sir. You mentioned uh, property. You said that uh, the federal soldiers may take your property. Yes. By property, do you mean your house? Well, no, uh, not specifically, although we have had some federal cavalrymen out at, to our property, and they have uh, pillaged the food there and attempted to drive off some of the livestock and poultry. No, specifically, I was referring to my slaves. And would you say the institution of slavery was the cause of this conflict? <laughs> I mean, it's been said both ways. I just like your perspective. My perspective is that, that there are people north and south who have varying ideas about what this country should be going forward. And I believe in the years prior to the war, uh, like two bullies trying to gain position on one another, uh, they simply got to the point where they started throwing blows. And, and uh, whether it was over slavery or whether it was over regional differences between the North and the South, uh, I'm sure I'm sure that uh, opinions vary on that. For me, um, I believe it clouds everything that, that we as a nation have gone through in the last four years. If that makes sense to you. It does. I think it gives our uh, some of the townsfolk a little bit to think about, right. you know, and, and maybe something to even and read up further, you know, read, read some uh, different perspectives, some from the areas where you live in the South, but also some the other perspectives that you may personally not agree with from the North, but I think, as you well know, and it's part of good education is multiple points of view. That's right, and I would certainly, certainly encourage these young people to educate themselves to the extent possible. Uh, why this conflict started? Well, why, why this conflict started and about other things. Uh, I've been the head of the, the education uh, committee here in the courthouse and, and also certainly uh, had my children educated. Uh, my oldest, uh, George, was valedictorian at Hampton Sydney College before he went off to, to war. And uh, my next oldest has aspirations to become a judge, so I'm told. So I encourage you all to educate yourselves to the extent possible. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dr. Thank you, folks. Now, we did, uh, we mentioned the institution of slavery, and there were a number of uh, African Americans who did live here in the village of Appomattox. Do good. Hold on a second. Do good, where you at? Woman, uh, I, I'm actually from the newspapers, and the newspapers? Uh, from the newspapers, ma'am, and then some of our readers here like to to get a, get a perspective of you. Newspaper may, may like, be interested in reading about you, ma'am. Newspaper like the newspaper with Dred Scott and his family be in. That's right, Dred Scott. I'm sure some of our readers have read about Dred Scott. Oh, do good. My husband, he said that they're the first colored folks on the on the newspaper anywhere in this whole land. On the front page of the newspaper, ma'am. And you want to put me on it? Well, perhaps, perhaps, but I think some folks, you know, would like to, to hear your story and, and may have some questions, and, and who knows, they, they may write an article that may appear in a newspaper at some point. Imagine that. Wouldn't that be something, me on the newspaper? But I, I tell you, I don't know whether it be the right and proper thing. My, my husband, he ain't here to tell me whether it's the right and proper thing to do. <laughs> well, I suppose there ain't no harm in it. No, no, ma'am. All right then. I say I do good. My mama, she be Sarah Hughes, and my papa, he be Edward Porter. I come into his, his world in the tobacco season of 1837. <laughs> At least that's what my husband tells me. Do good says that I come here uh, in 1837 and. I expect he should know, because uh, he's been here about 20 seasons more than I've been here. So he ought to know. <laughs> Do good and I? Well, we done, had, uh, we done had six children together, and we got one on the way here. 
Uh, the biggest, her name be Fanny, and the littlest, her name be Jemima. Now, Fanny, 10 seasons old, and Jemima, she just be two. Uh, do Good and Me, we've been mad. And we got mad back in 18 and 53 it was. And I was a slave, and since I was a slave, he had to own me. Uh, so I wouldn't get sent off to market and sold. So I was his slave. And since I, since my, he couldn't let me be free because he couldn't afford to pay the levy. And since I was slave, all my children, they be slaves too. Now ain't that something? No, your children be slaves. Yeah, they be slaves. And I tell you, I won't see them free at this. They say, the Yankee folks say that if they win this here war, we might have a chance to be free. Now the red folks, they say they win in the war and we likely won't never be free. So I sure hope the, the Yankees got it right. I sure does. But I got to find my husband, do good. I, I don't know if I had any time to, to sit here and, and bump the gums with you because uh, they've been fighting going on all day and I was looking for, for do good. And, I don't, I don't know. Y'all had to come do good. You do good. Come on over here. Charles Henry do good. Where you been? I didn't heard all this battle going oh, on around Sarah, here. Don't. And I was worried to death about you. Where you been? There's some, something going on over there down the hill yonder. I see all the tents. I saw all of that. I just came back from the grazing field now. Look, you know I you know we got the got the stock there. Mm -hmm. Got four here. Well, when I got there, I saw some fresh beef hide. I'm afraid that the, the, the federal soldiers, they done caught two of our cows. And oh, Lord, no. It's they always something. Them. And they were good. They were good. All they was giving milk. Well, here's what happened. I got up there and saw the hides. And then I saw two uh, soldiers, two or three or four more soldiers over by the, by the uh, fence. And I had a cow and a, and a bull tied up real tight. And, and they was over there kicking them. And so kicking I went over there, tried to plead with them. I said, I told you, sir, so listen. I say, these are the only cows we got left. Now, you can kill the other two. This is all we got. But see, but see, this is Sarah. They didn't get up. They didn't get up milk cows, did they? Well, we got one. I got the one in the, and in the cat. Lord, Hammer, so what we, we gonna gonna what we going to do? What we going to do? We got six children to feed, and they got the milk cow. Well, we got one. The, don't look. Don't worry. But see, oh. that's why as I put our valuables underneath the stone slab at the kitchen door that you oh, I told you, Lord, that's Lord, why. Because in Fabs and the Reds of Light, they is up there looting all the storehouses. What we gonna do? What we gonna do? What we gonna oh, do? Oh, don't worry, sir. Don't worry now. Don't worry. Lord provide as is always done for us. Well, you know it's best. The Lord will provide. And I got to keep my faith strong. I got to keep my faith strong. Well, let me tell you, this man here, he wants us to be on the yeah. newspaper. I've been trying. This man over here, he wants us to be on the newspaper sir? like the Dread yes, and Head Scott. And their family was on the newspaper. Ain't that something? All you got to do is tell these folks here what about, something about yourself and something about how you feel about the wall. Dread and Harry. <laughs> well, some of my reporters are right there, and they'll be glad to, to hear your story, sir. Well, sir. You go on. I suppose, uh, I suppose it's okay. So, uh, my name's Charles Henry Dugood. Uh, I'm about 48 years old. I uh, was born free. I'm a blacksmith. I've been a blacksmith since I was about 15 years old. See, uh, my mother, uh, Marsha Dugood, was emancipated before I was born. And so as I was born free. My father's Charles Dugood. Uh, right here in mathematics, I had a brother, James. Uh, we were blacksmithing together till about seven years ago. He up and left with his family, went up to Lynchburg. But then I, well, I, <clears throat> I suppose I can tell you this now, now that the Yankees are here, it's uh, no, no trouble, I suppose, now telling. Up until about a few months ago, you see, last year, I was uh, forced to labor for the Confederate Army around Richmond. I had been there for about 10 months, and then the whole time all I got was one pair of shoes. But they forced me, but in October last year, I up and ran away. I deserted Went up to Lynchburg where my brother is and worked my trade there. Then this spring, I just got back. See, what a lot of folk don't know is that free colored man, for the war, no more than a slave. I'm free, but not free. I don't have the benefit of my freedom. But now, so the Yankees here, I'm pretty sure that we have a chance that this will be for real for us, for me, my family, 
And, and for all the slaves here, a chance of freedom. Lord willing. Lord, Lord willing. willing. I guess that's all. I, that's something else. Uh, well, would some, you like to take a Derek tap? Uh, well, uh, actually, they may have some questions for you for their for their articles. Uh, do you have any questions for the do goods? If we were to surrender and it was up to you, what would you do with the Confederate soldiers? I don't know much about them. They've been telling us all the time that they were whipping the Yankees. That every battle they were winning turned out tank truth. So I just want to be here with my family. Don't want to be pressing to no service for somebody else. I was born free. I tend to stay free. My family, they have been slaves, but they're no slaves no longer. They're free. So what they do with the Rebs, no trouble with me, not an issue with me, but I want to have my family here. And I long since forgave them. Long since forgave them. All we want to do is have a, a good and happy life and keep our family together. That's what we want most. Be any more curiosities out there? When you heard about the Dred Scott case, what were your feelings on that? Well, I was, I was hoping and praying, I was hoping and praying that they be free. Because if they get free, then maybe we get free too. So that's what my thought was on that. I, I'll be truthful with you. I was never thought they was going to give that man his freedom. Never seen it, certainly not here in Virginia. I never thought I'd see it. Of course, out there in Missouri, I don't know. But here in Virginia, that man, he never had a, a chance of freedom. I think we have one more. Uh, if you, if the, if the union wins, what sort of rights or freedoms would you like to have? Well, I got my own land. I like to be able to protect my own property, my stock, and my cattle there, so I can take care of my family. That's all the rights I really want. I have my own life here, and I have no need for nothing else. Well, do good been do good been free all his life, and I ain't been free but short short. I like to know that my family's always gonna be free with me, and I's gonna be free, and ain't nobody can come along and take them in the middle of the night and sell them on down the river. I like to know that. I like to know that, and and God knows that's right right and, and proper thing to happen for us too. So um, I'm just hoping that we get our freedom, and that be the best rights we can ever have. Ain't that right, That's right, sir. <laughs> Thank you. Good day to you. Good day to you. Okay. And where those cows at? How's your feet? You know, the interesting thing, we're talking a lot about history, but, you know, when we talk about good history, it's not just like memorizing facts for the history test or how many names and generals can you put on the page or how many dates can you memorize. I mean, the power of history is the way the events so long ago affect us today. And so, you know, we were, we were looking at the events of 150 years ago here on this ground. And then with the conclusion of the American Civil War, we're going to see some amendments to the Constitution. For example, the 13th Amendment, which would abolish the institution of slavery. You got the, the 14th Amendment, which uh, gives rights to African Americans. And the 15th Amendment, which gives voting rights to African American men. However, if we go back, not 150 years ago, but... 50 years ago, we see this guy. And who's this gentleman with his hand up in the air? Martin Luther King Jr. Martin Luther King Jr. Very good, very good, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And uh, this is uh, when he was given the I Have a Dream speech. If you look in the corner, you also see a National Park Service ranger there as well. And that speech was given in Washington, D.C. at the Lincoln Memorial. So this is part of the civil rights movement. So my question and that we want to talk about is when he was giving that speech, he actually said a hundred years after the Civil War is over, quote, the Negro still is not free. Why did he say that? And why did he link what he's doing, what his speech is in 1965 to what happened a hundred years earlier in 18? 
65. Any, any, of us, any of us want to guess about that? Let's share a little bit of information. We have one coming up. All right. All right. Um, the reason why I said after that is because um, the African Americans still didn't have all the freedoms that they desired. They just had a couple like freedom that, and they had right to the men had right to vote, uh, but they still separated them like they were completely different things. Instead, of, like whites and blacks were completely different people. You know, they're kind of about the same. Right. Well, officially, they had the same rights. You know, they, officially, uh, they could vote. But in reality, could they really vote? No. No. In, in places, actually, like even here, um, not, not necessarily mathematics, but like here in Virginia, you know, there were certain things like that they would, that uh, white Southerners would impose, like poll taxes. You have to pay so much money to vote. You can vote. But you have to pay all this money, you know, um, and a lot of them couldn't afford to do that. Literacy requirements, they would say, well, if you're black, you have to be able to, to read and write. And of course, ladies and gentlemen, you know, with these folks who had been enslaved, when they were enslaved, were they taught to read and write? What do you think? Do you think slaves were taught to read and write? No. Matter of fact, in certain southern states, there were laws where you were forbidden to teach an enslaved person to read and write. So, right after the Civil War, yeah, you can vote, but then in some of these areas, they would say, well, we'll have things where you have to be able to write, knowing full well that they couldn't do that. So, this is what they call disenfranchisement. So, here we're standing in front of the McLean House where the American Civil War ended. You know, from this porch, you know, if you were here, 150 years ago, you would see Robert E. Lee, Lucy Simpson Grant walking off that porch. Lee comes right into the courtyard over here, mounts his horse traveler and salutes. Ulysses Simpson Grant rides away. You know, the road in front of the McLean house was a long road. Soldiers marched miles and miles and miles just to get here. But where this march for the Civil War ended, the march for the Civil Rights Movement started to begin. Now, having said that, the civil rights movement that did begin, uh, been going on and then culminating in the 1960s, actually did remove a lot of those things that disenfranchise people from voting. I mean, can African Americans, you know, right now can can pretty well vote, uh, just like like everyone else can. Uh, so a lot of that has been removed over time. So there has been a lot of success in the civil rights movement. So you know, we're looking here civil war, and then we see civil rights. But I got a question for you. Do you think the country still has a road to go for full equality for every one of its citizens? Do you ever talk about that in school sometimes? Or what are your own thoughts on that? Go ahead. Go ahead. Say it. There's no right or wrong answer. It's its, it's opinion. Yeah. I feel like there is more that we could do. To make it better. Okay. That's right. And, you know, but having, having said that, you know, this is here at Appomattox a very powerful piece of ground. You know, the most costly war in American history ended here. Um, the civil rights movement began here. And while you're right, there's more that can be done if you think about it. You know, right now, today, you know, we have an African American president of the United States. If you go back 150 years ago, like some of the soldiers were saying, they're African-American soldiers who were in the Union Army. So things have changed a lot. And if you think about our nation as the most powerful nation in the world, we've really come very far, very fast within the last 150 years. Um, that really here at the McLean House, the healing process between North and South really started to where there wasn't any anger or vindictiveness against the other sides, but like the do-goods were saying, in a sense, an aura of forgiveness. So in a sense, we can also see Appomattox as a very positive place. Uh, and it's really awesome to connect with all of you out there in Kansas here on this actual day, on this actual ground, right here 
where really we can say the American Civil War ended. Do we have any other questions from the audience? So, um, well, anybody any have a closing thoughts? I'm going to edit. We had a question, were, were Grant and Lee any sort of friends, say, prior to the war or after? Uh, that's a really awesome question. So here's the deal. Uh, they, they knew of each other. I wouldn't say they were friends, as a matter of fact. I wouldn't say they were enemies either. Uh, when Lee came to the McLean house right here, uh, he, he was waiting for Grant. Now, Lee was in his best uniform because he knew he was going to surrender. So he had the, the long gray coat and the gold braid. I mean, he really looked fancy, spit and polish. Grant, when he got the note that the Confederates were going to surrender, he was like 20 miles away. And the weather was just like today, muddy, rainy. So he and his, his staff officers are galloping on the horse. So when Grant comes here, he has a very informal uniform private's uniform with his general's insignia on his shoulders, but his pants all covered in boots, all covered in mud because the, the horse's hooves were splashing the mud up, and, and Grant comes in, and to break the ice, they start talking about uh, when they first met each other, which wasn't during the Civil War, was many years earlier during the war with Mexico, uh, when Lee was a captain, and uh, Grant uh, was a, a lieutenant. Ironically enough, the, re the reason they both remember the conversation, one of the ironies of history, is because Lee actually had to reprimand Grant for not coming to a staff officer meeting in full military uniform. Ironically, Grant comes here in a very informal, instead of his dress uniform, at the McLean house. But that occasion was the only time they both remember seeing each other. I, I, I have a question. When sure. you said Grant just rides up as quickly as possible, is he fearful that Lee will have second thoughts? Is that why he rides up so quickly, or is he um, it's just something that happens? That's an awesome question. The, the thing is, I, he wasn't really fearful that, that Lee would change his mind, but it was a symbol of respect. It's kind of like, you know, he doesn't want to keep him. Lee gets here first because he's already here. So Lee's already been waiting for a half hour before Grant shows up. So Grant doesn't really want to keep him waiting, you know, at all if he can help it. So he wants to get here as quick as possible. This is also a, a visitor said, well, how come Grant just didn't go back and get his good looking uniform? Well, because the good looking uniform was with like the wagons and all that, like, 25, 30 miles away. So if Grant had to go back and get that uniform, come here, put it on, then come here, then Lee would be waiting for like hours and hours, and Grant didn't want to do that. So it was really a respect kind of thing. A little, one cute little story I'll share with you. Uh, perhaps the first act of cooperation between North and South was in the parlor here at the McLean House. When the surrender terms were being written out, um, the Confederates didn't have any um, paper with them. It was Lee and one officer named Charles Marshall. He was a colonel, and he didn't have, they didn't have the paper. So they had to borrow paper from uh, the Union officers who were in the, in the McLean House so they could write out. Ironically, when the Union officers and Grant were, were writing the terms out, they ran out of ink. Well, the Confederate officer had the ink, so they actually, the Union officers had to borrow the ink from the Confederate guy, and the Confederates had to borrow the paper from the Union. But again, it's not like anyone planned all this. It's like, hey, the battle happened here, they got surrounded, got to give up, so it all just happens right here in the McLean house. So um, one Can thing you we're take doing that's always... Go ahead. Uh, the, we, we read through the exchange of letters from the 7th, 8th, mm -hmm. and 9th. Oh, wow. Can you take us through that, that timeline? 
Right. So as Lee's army is retreating, um, the Union is, is, is closing in on them, closing in on them. And um, it really starts on the 6th. Uh, there's a battle called Sailor's Creek, and it's a disaster for the Confederates. You know, they uh, Robert E. Lee loses like 20, 25 percent of his troops. Uh, 9,000 Confederates surrender. They said that the uh, number of prisoners was a mile long and four men abreast. I mean, just huge numbers of prisoners taken. Uh, Robert E. Lee was surprised when he saw it, looking from a hill distant. He actually said, my God, has the army dissolved. Um, Coming on the wake of that victory, Grant thinks, hey, these, these guys, it's only a matter of time. Why don't we try to end this now? So Grant will send a, a letter over to Lee like, hey, I'm paraphrasing here. Don't you kind of want to give up? Uh, Lee takes that letter, reviews it, uh, consults with his other officers. They decide against that. However, Lee's not stupid. I mean, he, he realizes there's still a very real chance and a, and a very likely chance that the that he's not going to get out of this, that he's going to eventually have to surrender the army at some point. So he sends a letter back to Grant, uh, essentially sounding Grant out. He wants to know what kind of guy Grant's going to be, what kind of terms Grant is going to give. Um, and, that's a, and that was a very smart thing to do. Uh, you may have studied earlier in the Civil War um, there was a, a battle, uh, Fort Donaldson out west, and uh, Grant said basically, my terms are unconditional surrender, just like give up, you know, you don't get any terms, you, you just become my prisoners, unconditional surrender. And he had a nickname for that, you know, I mean, they said Ulysses Simpson Grant or unconditional surrender Grant. So if that's the word in the street and that's the word going around, then... If I was Robert E. Lee or you Robert E. Lee, well, you want better terms. You want to look out for your guys. You want to look out for your troops. You don't want unconditionally surrender. You want to make sure these guys might get fed. You want to make sure they may get provided for, you know, that they're treated with dignity since they had fought for your cause, for the cause for such a long time. So by the same token, you don't want to be like, I'm just giving up. So the, the word comes back like, hey, we're in a sense, we're not giving up yet. However, if we're going to give up, what are the terms? You know, what, what are the terms that we could expect? And so, uh, so those are so in a way, the union guys, Grant, they're kind of getting a little bit of mixed signals, not exactly, but you know, they're reading. Both sides are kind of feeling each other out. Um, so I think by the time Grant, uh, Lee comes here, he has a clear idea of what terms he can expect, which were essentially very uh, generous terms that really went far to healing the nation. Ironically, both generals could have played their hands wrong. You know, Lee could have chosen, hey, I'm not going to give up. We're going to disperse. We're going to do guerrilla warfare. You know, we can, we'll can. we drag it out. We won't be an army anymore, but we can be a bunch of renegades and, and somehow perpetuate the war. And, and that the war would get nastier than it already was. Um, he chose not to do that. Grant could have played his hand in a sense wrong. He could have said, I want to humiliate those guys. You know, we've been fighting for so long. We want to get even. He chose not to do that. He chose to give those very generous terms. And those terms were really the signals that uh, the president of the United States at the time, Abraham Lincoln, essentially met with Grant and another union general named Sherman, and they discussed it. And, those, and that was essentially the tone that President Lincoln wanted set. <laughs> Any other questions? One more question. Yes, come on up. When writing the surrender, how do they know where to go? Like, who picks the house? Ah, that's good. It actually has to do with a, a person uh, from the town that I come from. I'm from Baltimore, Maryland, and uh, one of Lee's... Um, aide de camps, kind of like a helper, was uh, Colonel Charles Marshall. And Marshall comes riding into town, and according to Marshall's account, he says, the first white man uh, that I met was Wilmer McLean, who was walking along the lane. Uh, McLean directs Marshall 
Uh, basically, he says, I need a place for for the for this surrender to be worked out for for essentially Lee to to meet Grant Grant and Lee to get together. Where can we do this? Marshall directs him to a structure, not the, or McLean directs him not to his house, but to another building here at Appomattox, which was kind of run down. It was empty. It was dilapidated. And uh, Colonel Marshall looks at it. It's like, well, th that's not going to do. We're, we're not, you know, that that that's not going to be dignified enough for what's going to happen here. Then Mc Wilmer McLean's like, okay, the, the, the best one of the best houses in town is is my house. You can use my house, my parlor. So that's how the McLean house was chosen because uh, Lee's staff officer met Wilmer McLean right here, or right, right, probably somewhere right here in this courtyard. And then they went up uh, the steps, and the rest is is history. Interestingly enough, after the ceremony was over, you know. A lot of the Union officers, like George Armstrong Custer, he was here. Uh, General Sheridan was here. Uh, Lee had one officer with him in the house. Uh, Grant had a number of his command here as well. And uh, and uh, after the, the ceremony was over and Lee and, and Marshall went away, some of the Union soldiers actually bought items from Wilmer McLean, like desks and other things to take away as souvenirs. <laughs> Is, is it true that Custer takes Lee's table or something along that line and buys that? You're close. You're close. It was uh, Sher General Sheridan. Uh, and Custer was under Sheridan. Sheridan actually was responsible for the victory, and, and Sheridan wanted that table. So the uh, story is he had two gold pieces, uh, and McLean was kind of did, McLean didn't mind selling some of the furniture, but some of it he did, and he wanted to keep the table, uh, but. Um, Sheridan had one thing that Wilmer McLean didn't have. He had 65,000 armed troops. So Sheridan threw two gold pieces on the ground, on the on the carpet, saying, "Basically, take it or leave it. I'm taking the table," and that's what he did. We have uh, what I can do for you is uh, we also have a music demonstration we can do for you today. I don't know if you have anything else. Do you have any other questions though before we we talk about field music of of uh, the American Civil War? Ain't lied on my wife. There you go. Let me introduce a friend of mine right here. This is uh, Tim Urtel. How you he's, doing? he's a fifer. If you look at this thing he's got here, uh, this is a badge. Can you tell him what this is? Why guys have these little crosses like, on them? On and and what you do? So we are field musicians. So if we get separated from our units, our cores, we know they know who we belong to by these core badges. These are fifth core badges, so you can put them on your jackets, your hats, everywhere. So we are the 188th New York, so we're representing, this is fifth core, uh, first division. And what we do is we are the duty music for uh, the Army. We're the clockwork of the Army. We wake them up. We tell them when to eat. So you guys want to hear some stuff? Yeah. Hear some music? Yeah. Sure you do, right? <laughs> Alright, we'll play some marching music. This one's called Frog in the Well. Like that? Yeah. 
So, if you were all here at 4.30 this morning, we would have been able to wake you up if you were sleeping in tents. Okay? Our job is to wake the soldiers up. 4.30 this morning, the lead drummer had to come kick my feet and say, get up. All right? Who woke him up? The 24-7, 24 24-hour guard, right? The sergeant of the guard woke him up. And then he would come wake us up. And then we would play a series of six pieces of music to wake up all these soldiers in the entire camp. It's a lot of power, you know? We're important. We make a dollar more a month than those, guys, those soldiers. Because so we're musicians. So we play the Reveille. Three camps, Slow Scotch, Austrian, the Dutch, the Hessian, and the Quick Scotch. It's a lot of pieces. So there's a drum roll in between. It's kind of like an alarm clock, right? They hit an alarm clock in between, right? Put us on snooze. But at the end of, that, of those six pieces, they got to fall in for roll call, right? So that's what happens. And then we play, the next call is fatigue call, to get wood and water to make breakfast. And then we play breakfast call. So let's, let's play Reveille three of the pieces. All right? We're going to walk you through what it would be like. If you want, we can come to your classroom in the morning and play this. <laughs> three camps, slow scots. Yes, yeah, so that would be great. <laughs> You like that? Okay, we can do that. We'll do it in your living room and wake up your parents. All right. Life's up.
questions? Anybody got any questions? Yes, we have a couple. Awesome. Uh, you start out, uh, it seems like you were starting out slower and then got faster. Is that what you guys did to try to wake him up? Exactly. That's intentional. Good question. That is awesome. Start off real fast to wake them all up. And then there's a drum roll, kind of lulls them back to sleep with slow scotch. It was real slow, <laughs> melodic. And then we kick in with the Austrian, and it wakes them back up. Now remember, there's about three more pieces behind that. And they're very different in timing as well. But by the last piece, they know when to crawl out, put on their shoes, and fall in for roll call. So, yeah, good question. Um, you got more time? All right, keep going. So our instruments. Go ahead, we got more questions. Yeah, how long do you guys do a day practicing your songs before, before you need to play them? We practice year round. Fall. Never played with these guys before. Yeah, I've never, we've never actually played with these guys. So that's something to really understand is Civil War Fife and Drum music, there are manuals, right? There are about three or four different common publications that we all play out of so that when we get together, we can actually play. There, it might be rough, but if we were to play every day, it would be perfect. But you can see it wasn't exact or perfect, but you got the message. But yeah, we, we all rehearse throughout the off season and then in the spring, summer, fall, we're out here playing for thousands of visitors and people like yourselves. Yep. Does that answer your question? Uh, what was the role? What was your role during, say, a, a battle, pre-battle or after the battle? Uh, did you fight, or was there a particular reason for the drum and fife during the battle? Exact. Good question too. You all. Are I've seen the uh, pictures or movies of Revolutionary War soldiers marching in the battle, playing fifes and drums. That was very uncommon in the Civil War. The first thing they would do is head for the rear and assist the surgeons. All right, they would be picking off the limbs that once the surgeons would cut off the limbs, they would remove the limbs from the area. They would pull off the wounded off of the field, stretcher bearers. That was what they would do, because we're too valuable. We're duty music from sun up to sun down, Reveille to tattoo. Uh, so you don't want to put us out in front. Now, yes, there are occasions of uh, Civil War fife and drum marching into battle, such as Gettysburg, the Iron Brigade, uh, marching into battle, um, playing the Campbells are coming. Um, so yeah, there are some accounts where they marched in for inspiration uh, to get them up that hill. But our, our purpose is duty music and to assist the surgeons. And we have accounts of that. We know that's what happened. We read diaries. You can go online and uh, you do a Google search. Um, Drum Taps in Dixie, Delavan Miller. All right? It's a cool account. He's about how old? He's 13. 13 year old drummer. By the time he comes out of that war, he's seen horrific things that no 13 year old should see. He's a young man. And uh, there's really cool accounts. They also did a lot of practical jokes because they're kids, just like you guys. You know, they, they play a lot of pranks and they do all kinds of things like pull tent pegs out and play jokes on, on their on soldiers. So, And they were also very competitive. The New Englanders um, against the, yeah, New Yorkers, right? They're very competitive. So uh, they're they would have to play different types of music and compete. So we can play another example, if you'd like, of some marching music. That piece that the Iron Brigade played, um, Campbells Are Coming, um, Gary Owen, and we'll play it into Campbells Are Coming. It's a neat piece. You want to hear? We have one more question, if you don't mind. Not at all. I've already got them unloaded. So. Um, when you guys um, go to battle, um, when um, when the army starts charging, do you guys just um, go and follow them, or do you just stay behind and just hang out and, and just keep playing? We're we're kind of like medics, so we're we're right behind the lines and we're picking up wounded. So if there's still shooting going on, we we don't have any guns, so we're right. we're pulling them back back to safety. Yeah, we don't want to be up front. There's there's no point in us being up front. 
can't kill anybody with this. Just wake them up. All right. You want to hear a piece? And you have one more for us? One more piece for us? You got it. Any more questions? No? We have one more. Um, All right. Was it true that 13 year old boy that you were talking about earlier was to call the drummer boy a slow? Here. Say it again. All right. Drum hurts your ears. The 13 year old boy you were talking about earlier, was it true he was called the drummer boy of slow? Oh, uh, no, no. That, you're thinking of Johnny Clem. That's Johnny Clem. He was in a different unit. Other side of the war. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. There's, a, no a, there's a book you can also Google called Too Young to Die. It's all about young drummers in the Civil War. It talks about buglers, fife and drum, and young soldiers. So, and he's in there. Johnny Clem's in there. Delvin Miller. And all these cool quotes. So look that up. Fascinating story. Yeah, look that up. All right. Any other questions? One more. That weird. Did you guys only pull back your your own troops, or did you guys pull back the enemy too? As far as uh, it depends on where they are. Um, I mean, obviously, first and foremost, we need to get our troops out of harm's way. But if there's a ton of rebel wounded out there as well, I mean, and the surgeons can handle it, then why not? Um, but first and foremost, our job is to get our people into into a safe area. So, you know, if they can't get out on their own strength, we're, we're there to, to get them out for them. Anybody else? They're trying to figure out another sign of blood. Uh, uh, how do you dispose of the body parts when they, once they have been cut off? Those actually just get tossed out. It's like, uh, buried. or buried. It's like taking out the your ground. garbage and either putting it into compost or just leaving it out to rot. There's really no spent, uh -huh. set way to do it. A lot of the times, like houses like this, would be taken up as hospitals and windows would be open and you would have a pile of legs, arms, hands just laying outside and they keep tossing them out as the surgeons are cutting limbs off so there's really no set way they're they're not used not useful for anything so burn them bury them whatever you need to do just like the horses after a battle yeah yeah, yeah. dead horses bury them in a big ditch I imagine yeah the car the days after the carnage after a battle and what it was like to walk into that scene so, yeah, that was our job, along with waking up the army <laughs> and doing duty calls. So. All right. Want to hear another one? Thank you very much. All right. Yeah. All right, they're going to march off in a, in a second, but don't forget, uh, today, 
at uh, 10 past 3, we're having the bells across the nation, the Freedom Bells. Uh, 3 o'clock when Lee and Grant, which was the time that Lee and Grant came from this house, the McLean house, um, the formal surrender of the Army of Northern Virginia, the beginning of the end of the American Civil War, a bell was rung here. And what we want to do is make that a national thing. So if you have friends, you can send a tweet out, know anyone who has a bell, ring that bell at, at 3, 10 p.m. to bring this unit or to bring what happened here to the entire nation. There you go. All right. That's it. All set. You want to march now? March off? Yeah. For playoff? For playoff. They were cool. Good kids, man. Good kids. Kansas kids. Good yeah. kids. Dang. Good job. We're still alive, still hot. All right.